Hello, this is Josh Patel, back again with another biology lesson. Today we'll be finishing chapter 3, which was Principles of Ecology. And we'll start at 13.4, because we did the other in part 1. So our key concept for 13.4, which was food chains and food webs, is food chains and food webs model the flow of energy in an e ecosystem. So you guys probably seen a food chain or a food web in elementary school. And it basically just shows how energy flows in an ecosystem. And as we know, ecologists study how plants, animals, everything in an ecosystem interact. And this is just another way to show. So a food chain is a model that shows a sequence of feeding relationships. A food chain links species by their feeding relationships. A food chain allows the connection between one producer and a single chain of consumers within an ecosystem. So we usually always start out with a producer at first. So here we have grandma grass. It's a producer because it takes energy from the sun. It doesn't eat anything and it produces its own energy. And they're called autotrophs, if you remember. Then we get our primary consumer, which eats the producers. So we have our desert cocktail, cottontail, which is like a rabbit or a bunny. It eats our producer, so it's called a primary consumer. They're usually heterotrophs, I mean her herbivores, so they usually just eat producers. And then we have our either secondary and tertiary consumer, but here this is a short food chain, so we just have our hawk that eats the primary consumer. So depending on what, if they put, want to put anything in between, this could be a secondary or tertiary consumer. So, as we see, it's just one chain, one line of consumers and a producer. So, consumers are not all alike. We have herbivores, which eat only plants, which would be like a vegetarian. Carnivores, which eat only meat, and we usually think of dinosaurs. And then we have omnivores, which eat both plants and animals. So, most people, most humans, are omnivores. And then we have detrivores which eat dead organic matter and there are very few examples of this and a main one everybody knows is vultures they eat dead animals scavengers and then we have decomposers which are detrivores that break down organic matter into simple comp into simpler compounds and decomposers are very important for our world so carnivores we have this and then decomposers, we have mushrooms. So mushrooms actually take energy from a dead animal or the grass or a tree maybe, sometimes as fungi. And they take the energy and they decompose it and break it back down and put nutrients back into our soil. Specialists are consumers that primarily eat one specific organism or a very small number of organisms. This makes sense. It's a specialist. It only does one special thing. So, and then we have generalists, which are consumers that have a varying diet, which would probably be people because we eat all sorts of things. Trophic levels are the nourishment levels in a food chain. So trophic levels are levels of the pyramid and food webs, and they show different states of nourishment. So we have primary consumers, which are herbivores that eat producers. So primary is first, and so they're the first consumer, and the first consumer has to eat the producer. Then we have secondary consumers, which is second in consuming. So they eat the primary, and so they eat herbivores, because the primary consumers are usually herbivores. Then we have a tertiary consumer, which are carnivores that eat secondary consumers. So tertiary eats the secondary. So it goes in order. It makes a lot of sense. And then we have omnivores, such as humans, that eat both plants and animals, and they may be listed at different trophic levels in different food chains. So these are the trophic levels. So we have a rat, a snake, and a fox. And if we were to assign one of these to each one, go ahead and mentally match them up. So... Here we don't have any producers, but there would usually be like a producer here before the rat. So let's put a producer here. Let's say grass, and let's say rats eat grass. So we have our grass, which is our producer. 
and then here we have our primary consumer and this is a herbivore that only eats producers so it eats the grass and then so this herbivore is living off grass and then it gets eaten by the snake and the snake is the secondary consumer because it's a carnivore it only eats animals and it only eats herbivores so basically it eats primary consumers and then later on we have the tertiary consumer which is our fox in this case and it eats the secondary consumer so both of these are carnivores and they could be omnivores if you wanted to like okay the snake could be an omnivore it could eat a rat and it could maybe also eat grass or another plant so but the tertiary consumer is never an omnivore because it only eats secondary consumers it's a carnivore so a food web shows a complex network of feeding relationships which makes sense it's the web and webs are pretty complex so an organism may have multiple feed feeding relationships in an ecosystem so not one organism only eats one certain thing everything interacts a food web emphasizes complicated feeding relationships and energy flows in an ecosystem so as something eats it also gains energy so this food web it basically shows energy transformations so here is our example of a food web it's kind of hard to see because it's kind of small but this is an ocean biome and so at the very bottom we have producers like algae okay so let's just say this is algae it's probably some bacteria so the bacteria gets eaten by fish and turtles and this fish is also eaten by a shark so this chain right here would kind of just be a food chain if we took it out and put it by itself but the shark also eats another type of fish so it's kind of a food chain now and so then we have plankton here or shrimp I think it might be and the jellyfish eats it and a fish eats it and then this fish gets eaten by the shark but then we also have some zooplankton here that get eaten by the shrimp and everything is basically just connected to each other and at the top here we would have the tertiary consumers at the bottom here we would have producers but the zooplankton is a producer but it's at the top it's just because it, it shouldn't be like that it should be at the bottom but I think they're trying to put it closer to the sun because that's where it gets its energy from so but usually you could draw maybe like a pyramid and actually draw lines to show different levels so 13.5 is cycling of matter matter cycles in and out of an ecosystem and as we as we know matter is basically just stuff water cycles through the environment so water is matter the hydraulic or water cycle is a circular path of water on earth so that it shows how water transfers through different stages organisms at organisms all have bodies made mostly of water so here's a simple example of the water cycle so we have water storage in an ocean lake or anything it evaporates and condenses into clouds but we also get water through trees and plants through transpiration which is basically where the trees kind of sweat or they leak water through pores on their leaves and the, this also evaporates so this makes clouds and they condense and then eventually the clouds rain and they do precipitation could either be rain snow sleet anything hail and so it hits the ground it does has surface runoff and the runoff goes into usually back to the ocean or to a river or a lake and then some water seeps into the ground into groundwater and there's underground seepage which also eventually leads back into a water storage area so that's the water cycle elements essential for life also cycle through ecosystems a biochemical cycle is the movement of a particular chemical through bi the biological and geographic parts of an ecosystem so we've probably heard of some of these like the carbon cycle is the main one and then there's also a nitrogen cycle so the main processes involved in the oxygen cycle are photosynthesis and respiration oxygen cycles indirectly through the ecosystem by the cycling of other nutrients so we might know how oxygen cycles but we're going to learn it anyway so 
we have people or animals, and then we have trees and plants. Oops, okay. So our people, we take oxygen from the atmosphere, so there's just oxygen in the atmosphere. Humans and other animals breathe it in, and they breathe out carbon dioxide. And this is the process of converting oxygen to carbon dioxide is cellular respiration, and that's what we do. So we take in oxygen, and the oxygen is used in cellu cellular respiration, which kind of gives us energy. And then we spit out the oxygen, or the, we spit out the carbon dioxide. And then the carbon dioxide in the air is taken up by trees and plants through photosynthesis. And they take the carbon dioxide and they turn it back into oxygen and they spit it out. So it's kind of like a nice cycle going on. We help each other. And then trees also do cell cellular respiration, so they they also take in oxygen. So they take in carbon dioxide and oxygen, but in this cycle we're only showing it taking in carbon dioxide, so it's more like a cycle. Carbon is the building block of life. You might have heard that already. The carbon cycle moves carbon from the atmosphere through the food web and returns to the atmosphere. So carbon is emitted by the burning of fossil fuels. Carbon is a building block of life because it's basically used in everything. And in sci-fi movies, you might hear carbon-based life form because we're basically made of carbon. So carbon is emitted by burning fossil fuels, and some carbon is stored for long periods of times in areas called carbon sinks. So carbon sinks would be basically big bodies of water, usually. So here we have our eventual thing as we get carbon dioxide in the air. So the carbon dioxide in the air is taken by trees and plants and by photosynthesis. So the trees do photosynthesis with carbon dioxide and they basically absorb it. And eventually when animals that, when the trees and plants die, or animals that eat the trees and plants, so like cows, horses, any herbivores that eat the plants, when they die, their bodies decompose. And once they decompose, all of the carbon in them goes into the into the ground and creates fossil fuels or it's just stored in the ground. And then fossil fuels, for example, is taken for factories like coal. Coal is basically carbon and it's combusted or it's used, it's burned up. And burning all these bad fossil burning all these fossil fuels and coals produces more carbon dioxide in the air, which is actually pretty bad because it destroys the ozone layer. So we produce all these toxic gases along with carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide just goes back into the air, which is taken back by photosynthesis. But then in the ocean, the same type of thing happens. So oceans are usually called carbon sinks, because they just have a lot of carbon in them. And algae and other plants in the water take the carbon dioxide right from the water and release oxygen. So if you have a water plant and it's submerged underwater, you might see bubbles come out of it because that's the oxygen it's sending back after it took in the carbon dioxide. So the nitrogen cycle mostly takes place underground. Some bacteria convert gaseous nitrogen into ammonia through a process called nitrogen fixation. Some nitrogen fixing bacteria live in the nodules on the roots of plants. Others live freely in the soil. So here we have nitrogen in the atmosphere, it go, it's taken by the plants, and, or it just goes straight into the ground, and there are these nitrogen, nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil, and they're also in, in roots of plants. So plants, they have roots, and then they might have some little bumps on them, which are called nodules, and that's where the nitrogen fixing bacteria live. So they take the nitrogen, and they turn it into ammonium which is NH4, so it has one nitrogen and four hydrogen. So they basically attach hydrogen to this piece of nitrogen. And this also happens through decom decomposers, they turn them into ammonium too. And then the ammonium goes to nitrifying bacteria, which basically just take the ammonium and turn it into nitrate, which is NO2, and then it becomes nitrates through nitrifying bacteria. And nitrate is NO3, and then from there it goes back into the atmosphere as a gas, and the cycle happens over and over again. 
And so there's these, basically, the cycle is nitrogen goes underground and there's a series of bacteria that change nitrogen into ammonium and then nitrate, or nitrite and then nitrate. This isn't a very important cycle. They're probably not going to ask you many questions about this. So ammonia released into the soil is transformed into ammonium, and then nitrifying bacteria change ammonium into nitrate. Nitrogen moves through the food web and returns to the soil during decomposition. So the phosphorus cycle takes place at and below ground level. Phosphate is released by the weathering of rocks. Phosphate moves on through the food webs and returns to the soil during decomposition. This is also a non-important cycle. So phosphorus leaches into groundwater from the soil and is locked in sediments. Both mining and agriculture add phosphorus into the environment. So agriculture would be like pest controls and pesticides, which add phosphorus. So we have geologic uplift, which the, after the weathering of rocks forms runoff and phosphate goes into the soil or, or the water. So phosphate in the soil is taken by plants Plants are eaten by animals, and then once the animals die, decomposers like fungi take the phosphate and put it back into the soil, because as we know, they're special and they can, the detroits, they, they're decomposers that take the nutrients and put them back into, the, back into a cycle, so they put it back into the soil. And then it can also leak into rivers and pools of water, so phosphate in solution which forms new rocks through sedimentation, which goes back to geologic uplifting where they eventually weather down through rain. So 13.6, which is pyramid models. So this is when I was talking about pyramids of different trophic levels. Pyramids model the distribution of energy and matter in an ecosystem. So we already know energy and metal energy and matter flow through an ecosystem. So an energy pyramid shows the distribution of energy among trophic levels. And as we know, trophic levels are different levels of energy or nutrition. Energy pyramids compare energy used by producers and other organisms on trophic levels. Between each tier of an energy pyramid, up to 90% of the energy is lost into the atmosphere as heat and only 10% of the energy at each tier is transferred from one trophic level to the next. So this 10% is a very important number to ask you. I am, it's probably guaranteed that they're going to ask you questions about this. So we have to know, going up the pyramid, only 10% of energy is transferred at each stage. <clears throat> so here is our pyramid here. So energy is lost each stage these arrows pointing outwards is energy lost so here we have our producers and we have a lot more of them so we have a lot of producers and then they're eaten by primary consumers which are herbivores and so they eat the thing and from this level to this level only 10 percent of energy is transferred so here we have 100 percent of energy and only 10 percent of that is transferred here so here we have basically 10% and then we only pass on 1% and it just keeps going down. Drop to zero every time. So we have a lot of producers and then we have fewer primary consumers. And then primary consumers are eaten by secondary consumers and we have even fewer, fewer of those. And then from secondary consumers we go to tertiary consumers and we have very few of those. So you may be wondering why or how is energy lost at each stage, and this is due to the activity of the animals. So as we know, animals eat, they run around, they play, they hunt, and they do all sorts of active stuff. And this drains their energy, or it uses up energy. So once they use up the energy, they have to eat, but eating also takes up energy. So basically their body just uses energy also to stay alive, and that's why energy is lost. So here, plants, they don't have to do anything, they don't have to do much to stay alive and healthy. So they have a lot of energy. And then once, the, once they're eaten, this, these animals have all, they got a lot of energy from the plants. 
but they use it all up running around from their predators. And then once the predators eat the exhausted animal after it was tra being chased around, it lost a lot of the energy it ate from the grass. So then the secondary consumers get the scraps of energy the primary consumers had after they were running around getting exhausted. And then the same thing happens from secondary to primary, I mean tertiary. So tertiary consumers have the least amount of energy and since there's not that much energy for all the tertiary consumers, there, there's only a very, there's a very few amount of tertiary consumers because there's not that much energy up there. Other pyramid models illustrate an ecosystem's biomass and distribution of organisms. So biomass is a measure of the total dry mass of organisms in a given area. And this basically shows how many there are or the weight of them in weight is trying to correspond with how many there are. So producers, we have a lot, we have 2,000. And then primary consumers, we have a little less, or a lot less, we have 675. And then we go up to secondary consumers, we have 150. And then tertiary consumers, we have 75. So the mass decreases as we go up, showing that there are way more producers to sustain life for consumers. A pyramid of numbers shows the number of individual organisms at each trophic level in an ecosystem. So at the bottom we have only producers, and here it's saying we have 5 million producers. And then for our primary consumers, we only have 500,000. And then our secondary consumers, we have 5,000. And tertiary consumers, we only have 5, which is way less than 5 million. So basically, tertiary consumers, there's not much energy up there, so there's only enough energy to support five of them. So a vast number of producers are required to support even a few top-level consumers. So for just five tertiary consumers, just five, we need five million producers. So it's really bad. You don't get that much energy from eating a secondary consumer or a primary consumer. So the animals that get the most energy are herbivores so it's kind of good to be vegetarian because you get all the energy you can get without wasting any so that's the end of chapter 13 which is all about the principles of ecology next time we will be doing chapter 14 and if you didn't get anything make sure you rewatch the video or just study that part in your book and so Make sure you do well on all your tests and everything, and so make sure you watch the next video.